Romans chapter 5 tonight. My voice got worse, and then God miraculously gave it back to me right in the middle of our senior adult Bible study this morning as we study the book of 1 John. If you haven't been coming and you can come, we'll be here at 9.30 in the morning walking through the rest of chapter 3. We might dive into chapter 4 a little bit tomorrow morning. It's been a great time for me to study God's Word and to share with one another. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. This is the heart of the gospel in the book of Romans. 4, 5, and 6. Next week we'll be in chapter 5 of the second half. We'll cover the rest of chapter 5, which is 12 through 21. And then we'll get into chapter 6. I'm going to cover two verses, the first message in chapter 6, because there's so much in the first two verses of chapter 6. Tonight's message I entitled The Peace of God. How do we have the peace of God? When peace like a river, I love the, the great hymns. How do we have that peace like a river? We're going to learn three words tonight, three very important words from 11 verses of Romans chapter 5. We've talked about justification a lot, but the scriptures in Romans are repetitive on justification because it it's needs to be emphasized. We talked about faith over the last several weeks. But let me read our text out of Romans chapter 5. Let's look at justification tonight and what that means from the first five verses. And then we'll look at substitution. And then we'll look at reconciliation. Three very important parts of the gospel. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, since God saved us, when he saved us, he justified us. Since that has happened, we have peace with God. Who has true peace? All those who have been justified. Who, do not, who does not have peace in this world? Those who have not been saved. They have not been justified by God. We have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. Through him we have also obtained access. We have access to God. By faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. When you have peace that passes all understandings, you can rejoice even in your sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. These are in increasing order in the Greek language. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The peace of God comes from the justification of God. We define justification, and I want to define it again for you. Justification literally means to declare righteous, not guilty. It would be the opposite of to declare condemned. We stand condemned before God, and God looks at us when he saves us by his gift of grace, through our response to his gift of grace in faith, he justifies us. We are guilty, but he declares us not guilty so that God is satisfied by Christ's righteousness taking our place. When that happens and we understand that, we wrap our minds and our hearts around that concept, we'll have peace even through suffering. We'll have peace even in the midst of a storm. I loved looking at Facebook pictures last night of parents having baseball helmets and football helmets on their kids and we cleaned out our closet underneath the stairs that's the only place we have that doesn't have windows in it in our house we cleaned the whole thing out boxes all over the living room so if the storm hit we could get in the closet and I took my boys uh, Noah's got a Razor motorcycle helmet and Joshua's got a scooter helmet he doesn't like to wear it, but it's a motorcycle helmet that we make him wear and so we put the helmets in the closet so if they had to run in there they could put the helmets on and we could shut the door and Hunker down was the term on Facebook the whole afternoon. And we could hunker down for the storm. Well, I couldn't find Noah last night. I got the, win the windows open, or the blinds anyway, and I'm looking outside, watching the trees go back and forth, watching my security sign blow across the backyard. I was like, how'd he get in the backyard? It was in the front yard. And I'm watching it, and I'm wondering if, you know, I'm listening for the train sound of a tornado so we can get in the closet. And I asked Christy, where's Noah at? She goes, I don't know. And I walked by the closet door, and he's sitting there on the bench in the closet with his helmet on. He's sitting there. I said, son, what are you doing? He said, I'm scared. I'm scared. 
We don't have to be scared no matter what the world gives us when we've been justified by God and we have the peace of God. Even if death comes our way, God is satisfied by what he's done with his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross on our behalf. So we have, we're going to learn tonight, two beautiful parts of justification. We have acceptance and we have access. Because we've been justified, how are we seen before God? Here's the first one as a sub-point of justification tonight, acceptance. Romans 5, verse 1 again. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, through our faith, we've been accepted by God. What does it mean to you to be accepted by God? Because from the creation of the world, when sin entered the world, we were no longer accepted before God. Because we were sinners, and we couldn't stand before a holy, holy, holy God. But because of Jesus, and we're going to learn the last word tonight, reconciled us back to God... Now that we've been justified, we've been declared not guilty before God, we can have access and be accepted to him instead of rejected by God. When you understand that, you have peace. When you understand that, it doesn't matter what happens with the economy because our hope's not in the economy. It doesn't matter who gets president of the United States because our hope's not in the president. Our hope's in Jesus Christ. I stopped watching the election because in my opinion, it keeps getting worse by the candidates that are rising to the top on both sides. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to stop watching. That doesn't look good. And then God reminds me, I, I, I'm still in control. I mean, he reminds me of who we had president for the last several years. And I mean, I think about all the bad things that's happened in our country, but God is still in control. He still reigns on his throne. And people are still being saved and baptized here in God's church through all those different things. We have acceptance from God, which means we have peace with God. You're accepted. If you're saved tonight, you're accepted by God. And guess what? You're not accepted based on anything you've done. You're accepted based on everything that Jesus Christ has done. He's the one that makes us acceptable in his sight. We can't earn that acceptance. It's not like we can pat ourselves on the back and say, look, I'm accepted and someone else is not. No, it's by the grace of God that we are justified. We have acceptance, and I love this next word. We have access to God. In the Old Testament, you didn't have access to God unless you're the high priest. You go in the Holy of Holies. You had to go to someone else to confess sin and have a sacrifice offered on your behalf. But when Jesus died on the cross, now when we are justified, we have direct access to God. We don't have to go to a priest for confession. We can go straight to God because the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, symbolizing that God is the one who took the veil away and that all people now can be ushered into the Holy of Holies because guess what? Our body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit and God lives in us in the form of the Holy Spirit. And we are accepted by God and we have access to God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every single week of the year. And nothing can change that. We didn't do anything to deserve it. It was a gracious gift of our Heavenly Father. Romans 5, verse 2. Through him, we have also obtained, it was given to us. Obtain makes us think we can earn it, but that's not what it means there. Access, how? By faith, which remember from last week is a response to God's grace. Into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. When you have peace, you rejoice. And when you have access, you rejoice, and you have peace. Are you thankful tonight that you don't have to go to a priest to confess your sins and go get a bull and sacrifice it on an altar and have the blood spilled out on the altar for forgiveness of your sins? And then once you did that, you went out and sinned on the way home, you got to go do it all over again. Because it wasn't a continual thing. You had, it wasn't a one-time event that lasted forever. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is now the once and only sacrifice, Scripture says, for our sins, and now we have direct access to him, and I can talk to him any second of any day. I don't have to wait in line. The phone's never busy on his end. I can always talk to him, and I can always confess my sin to him at any moment of any day. That's why the Bible tells us to pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God, Scripture says, in Christ Jesus. We have access to God, and we're accepted in front of God, 
that ought to give you peace no matter what happens in your life. If you remember that, of course, the enemy's job is to help us to focus on the problems and the sufferings in the world instead of our position in Christ in front of God. Anytime the enemy reminds you of everything that you've done wrong, remind the enemy of where you stand in your relationship to Jesus Christ. Christ is in you. You're in Christ, and Christ is in God, and we are accepted by God. No one is worthy to be accepted. We're based worthy on the blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness, and we have direct access to him. Justification, a crucial part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're just talking about two aspects, acceptance and access tonight. Here's the second deep word in the heart of the gospel here in Romans chapter 5, substitution. I believe in substitutionary atonement. And that means I believe that Jesus Christ took my place. What I deserve to pay, the wrath of God poured out on me. Jesus took my place and paid it in my place. He died for me, not just as a symbolic gesture that Jesus actually didn't just suffer physical death on the cross. God's wrath was poured out on him on a few hours on the cross because he's infinite God for what I as a mortal man deserve to go to hell and my eternity in hell could not pay for it all. I believe scripture teaches that concretely. Romans 5 verse 6. For while we were still weak, sinners, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The Greek language says in our worst of sin, Christ died for us. He didn't come and die for us at my best for God. He died for me at my worst. For no one, for one, excuse me, will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. Verse 8 of Romans 5, a great verse. But God showed his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The King James Version says, but God commendeth his love toward us. The ESV says he shows it in verse 8 or demonstrates it, other translations say. God proved his love for us that while we were steeped in the worst of sin, that's when Christ died for us. He substituted for us. Put a lot of verses down on your handout. and I had so many verses I didn't fit them all on your handout, but I just wrote them down in my notes. Just listen to some of these verses that you can see the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ for our sins. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son in my place. Ephesians 5, 25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. In the literal Greek, in her place. Galatians 2, 20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me in exchange for me. Then I put these on your handout, Hebrews 2, 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, this is Jesus, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Fancy word, propitiation, a very important word in the gospel. I think we don't need to skip over those. We need to explain those and what they really mean. 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiations for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 4.10 And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The best definition I can give you from the Greek language where we get the English phrase propitiation is to satisfy wrath. To appease God, to satisfy God, but the, the word includes to satisfy based on the idea of wrath, which means God's wrath was poured out on Jesus to satisfy the justice and righteousness of God, that I should go to hell forever and pay f- for righteousness to be served, for justice to be served. It was poured out on Jesus in my place instead of me as a substitution event. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, in place of the unrighteous, 
that he might bring us, we'll see what reconciliation is in a moment, the last beautiful word here in the heart of the gospel, Romans chapter 5, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God gave us a gift, and that gift is Jesus, and Jesus suffered. He wasn't just beaten physically almost to death. That's, not, that's bad. I'm not, not minimizing his physical torture on the cross, nails in his hands and feet, because Jesus literally suffocated in his own blood on the cross for us. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part, the reason why Jesus was in the garden hours before sweating drops of blood and saying, God, take the cup from me. The cup is a symbol of God's wrath. And what Jesus was concerned in his humanity side of the God-man, Jesus Christ, is that God's wrath will be poured out on me for the sins that people deserve to go to hell forever and pay. It's going to be put on me instead of them. You do realize in biblical times, they didn't beat somebody almost to death and then put them on the cross. That just happened to Jesus. Remember, Pilate's great plan was if I have him beaten with 39 lashes, then that way when I present him back to the people, they'll feel sorry for him and they'll let him go because he just claimed to be the son of God. And, and Pilate was trying to wash his hands of the whole thing. His wife had a bad dream about it, and he's trying to get out of it. They normally didn't beat somebody. Forty lashes would kill a man. They normally didn't beat somebody upon recognition and then put them to the cross. That's why Jesus couldn't carry his cross all the way to Golgotha. That's why he died in just a few hours when most people that were put on a cross because they weren't beaten before that point would, would spend three or four days on the cross and then die. Jesus went through excruciating physical pain for us, but then he took his own father's punishment so that justice could be served, so that God could be satisfied, God could be appeased based on the wrath that had to be punished for sin. He did that in our place. You talking about the peace of God. How much does God love us? I mean, what could he do more than what he's already done for us than to receive the worst punishment ever in our place? If that doesn't bring you peace, that you stand before God accepted, and Jesus paid that ultimate, harsh, cruel, unbearable punishment on our behalf, I don't know what will bring you joy and peace in this world. I believe in the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8, but God showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, look at this phrase now, Christ died for us. The Greek word is huper there for for. The better rendering into English, we use the word for for a lot of things in English. The better rendering is instead of from the Greek. But God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died instead of us. Christ was punished instead of us. Now you're talking about a great substitution. I mean, that's why I say if you really understand the gospel, you don't look for greater things down the road one day after God saved you because the greatest gift of all has already been given to you. You just grow and being sanctified and you love God more every day. But you're not looking forward to something better because you've already got the greatest gift of all. So you rejoice every day that nothing is going to ever top what Jesus Christ gave you at the moment that he justified you. He declared you not guilty. We'll get to see God in all of his fullness one day. But if we're not going to rejoice now, why do we think we're going to rejoice one day? Christ died for us. The suffering, the shame, the sinlessness. He did it for us. Here's some other verses that are not on your handout that I wrote down in my notes. 1 Peter 3, 18. The just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 2, 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Isaiah 53, 4, 4 and 5. Surely he, was, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. 
who have been declared not guilty before God, justified. By his grace that we respond to in faith, we have been justified not because we deserve it, because God's gift of grace. And when we understand justification, another heart of the gospel is substitution that Jesus did on our behalf. That brings us peace because I won't have to pay for my sins in hell forever. I'll never have to pay for a single one. If I have to go suffer in purgatory, which I believe is very unbiblical, if I have to suffer in purgatory for some of my sins, then what Jesus did on the cross wasn't sufficient. And the scripture says it was sufficient. It was complete. Jesus says it, it, is, it is finished. It's been paid in full. I mean, that brings us peace to know that we shouldn't be accepted before God, but we are. And we shouldn't have access to God because of our unholiness, but God gives it to us anyway because of his great love for us. <laughs> Martin Luther told in one of his biographies how one day Satan came to him, he means laid a thought on his mind, and said, Luther, you're lost for you're a sinner. And Luther replied back, Satan, thank you for saying that I'm a sinner. Inasmuch as you say that I'm a sinner, Christ died for sinners. And if Martin Luther is a sinner, Christ died for him. <laughs> Martin Luther grasped that concept that, yes, I'm a sinner, but Jesus took my place and received my punishment. That ought to cause us to rejoice every single day in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Justification, substitution, and there's not one word better than another. They're all unbelievable parts of the gospel. Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Romans 5, verses 9 through 11, you're going to see the word reconciled or reconciliation three times in just three verses. Verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from what? What are we saved from? The wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, <laughs> that's how we were before Christ saved us, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Verse 11. More than that. It keeps building. Okay. Much more in verse 10. Verse 11. More than that. More than the much more. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received. Here's the third time you see the word reconciliation. We've been reconciled. That's a wonderful truth. Okay, like the prodigal son was reconciled to the father, we have now been reconciled to our heavenly father through his son, Jesus Christ. The word reconcile, the best definition I've seen of reconciliation, it means to exchange hostility or enmity for friendship. It's the picture of two people who are estranged in their relationship that are brought back together into complete harmony in their relationship. When sin entered the world with Adam and Eve, we were set apart from God. God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. He could no longer be in their physical presence. They were out of the presence of a holy, holy, holy God. We were estranged. We were hostile towards God. We became his enemies from that point on. But when we were born, we were born with that enmity and that separation from God. But what Jesus did on the cross gave us reconciliation. It brought us back in a right relationship with the Holy God, and we didn't do anything to deserve it. It was what God did by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to give us that reconciliation. We deserve his wrath. <laughs> he sends reconciliation. We deserve to be separated forever. And he says, no, I love my creation that I created in my image to bring me glory, and I will not leave them in that situation. I will not leave them as enemies, estranged in their relationship from me. I will send a part of myself to suffer horrifically so that they can be brought back to me. I mean, the gospel is a beautiful thing when you understand it. And it brings peace, and it brings joy that this world cannot even begin to touch. One of my favorite passages on reconciliation is 2 Corinthians 5, so I'll put that on your handout to close tonight. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God reconciled us. The old is gone. The new has come. We've been brought back into fellowship with God since we were born separated from God. He not only says he reconciles us, but he gives us the ministry of reconciliation, which means we have the ministry of the gospel to go out and see other people reconciled back to God. That's the ministry of every Bible-believing, uh, great commission-following church is the ministry of reconciliation, to see people that are lost as separated from God and that the gospel of Jesus Christ brings them back into fellowship with God, and that's the ministry of the church. It's a ministry of hope. It's a ministry of healing. Then it says in verse 19 of 2 Corinthians 5, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We have the ministry of reconciliation, and the only message we have worth offering is the gospel, which is the message, verse 19 says, of reconciliation. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're his spokesmen. God making his appeal through us as his believers. We implore you, Better rendering for South Louisiana, we beg you. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Why would you beg somebody to be reconciled to God? Because you don't want them to miss the greatest gift of all. And if they miss it, they're going to spend eternity paying for their sins that Christ died to pay for in their place. We implore you, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. There's so much that happened on the cross that sometimes we just point out one thing and we miss all the others. Jesus Christ took the punishment for sin, but the scripture says he also became sin. He became the sacrifice for sin. He received the punishment for sin. There's so many things happening on the cross over 2,000 years ago. That's why Jesus split time in half as we know it. Because the most crucial event ever in the history of the world was Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Because we have been justified because of what Jesus did. He became our substitute on the cross and took the wrath of God in our place. And he did all of that so that we could be brought back into fellowship with God. We can be reconciled. So if God did all that so that we could be brought back to God, shouldn't we live in a close reconciliation with God? Shouldn't we live in close fellowship with God? Why should we be set free from our bondage of sin to let sin still shackle us when God set us free to be in an intimate, close fellowship with the Father? Then the best way we can show God how much we love Him and are thankful that He justified us and was our great substitute and reconciled us is to live out of love and obedience back to God. And when that happens, we're at peace. Not because we live perfectly today, because no one did. But because Jesus has given it all for us, that it's a deep joy, a deep love that we have for our Heavenly Father, that we have peace, that we know no matter what happens, He's still in control. He has it all taken care of. And my responsibility as a follower of Jesus Christ is to fall more in love with my Savior every single day which means I should have more peace every day in this world that has no peace. I shouldn't live like the world. I shouldn't worry like the world. I shouldn't get upset like the world. I shouldn't get anxious like the world. I shouldn't let what goes on on the news distraught me like it does the world because my hope is not in temporary things. My hope is in eternal things. And Jesus Christ gave me the greatest hope of all in what he did for me on the cross over 2,000 years ago. The gospel Man, when you preach the gospel to yourself, it's hard to get upset at the end of the day. It's hard to go to bed angry when you realize Jesus gave it all for us. I mean, I'm watching the news the whole afternoon yesterday with all the storms going on, and there's somebody standing there, and their house is just demolished, and they're like, I'm just thankful that we're alive. Because all that's temporary. It's just temporary, you know? 
You think they're excited? They lost every physical thing they had? No. But the great hymns that we sing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. Yeah. On the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. There's beauty in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every day we should be extremely grateful that Jesus took our place. We should be so grateful that he took our place that people that don't understand that and haven't received him by grace through faith, we, are, we implore you on behalf of Christ. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. I've begged people to come to Christ. I've begged my father-in-law to come to Christ. Why? Because I know if he does it, when he passes away, he's going to be in eternity separated from God. And that crushes me. That crushes my wife. So I've begged him, and he's begged me to stop telling him about Jesus. And I, and I, you don't understand. When you have the greatest gift of all to offer someone, you're going to keep giving that gift, and it's never going to get to a point. I mean, if he hates me, that's one thing. It's another thing to be separated from God for all eternity. I'm okay with begging people. I can't save him. He's got to choose on his own to respond to the grace of God. I can't force it on him, but I can show him the dire need to come to know Jesus Christ because there's no greater need in this world. The beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll finish chapter 5 next week, and we'll look at a message next week on how God saved us even in our sin. Let's read the next half of chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, and think about death and how death came through sin because it's repeated over and over again, but how God freed us from the death and sin's grip on us. Let's pray tonight.